It's Thursday, September 29th, 2016. I'm Owen Troyer from InfoWars.com, and this is what to expect on tonight's Nightly News. Tonight, Obama holds a town hall after his veto of the 9-11 Victims Bill, where he tried to throw American victims under the Saudi bus. We look at how he spends it, and as a bonus, the Muslim apologist-in-chief explains why he won't say Islamic Terrorism. The truth of the matter is, is that this is an issue that has been sort of manufactured. Then, folder guy, poker player hand signals. Did Hillary use hand signals to coordinate with the debate moderator, Lester Holt? And what is Hillary's concealed carry? And we look at a network of Clinton money laundering super PACs and nonprofits, and the man who runs them for her. David Brock of Media Matters. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Welcome into the Nightly News. I'm Owen Schroyer from InfoWars.com. And tonight we kick off with a response to Barack Obama's town hall last night. Now, I expected this town hall to be completely purposed in attacking Donald Trump, trying to make Donald Trump the bad guy, finding whatever angle they could to try to steer CNN voters away from Donald Trump. Now, it did not end up being that type of a town hall with President Obama last night. However, just like any time President Barack Obama speaks, there's plenty of lies, there's plenty of misinformation, so we have to call him out on it. Uh, I don't want to in any way sugarcoat the fact that there have been significant problems in the VA that have accumulated over decades. So there's Barack Obama admitting that the VA has major issues. And then he talks about how these issues have been uh, building up over decades. Well, you know, my problem with this Barack Obama is that it's your administration and it's your policies that have put the needs of individuals who come to this country illegally ahead of the needs of veterans. Now, we've got all kinds of case studies that can prove this. In fact, we know that people who come here illegally as refugees get a bigger stipend from the government than veterans do. So if Barack Obama is going to sit here and admit that there's major problems in the VA, he better look himself right in the mirror and admit that his policies are partially responsible. Let's roll to the next one. Honoring our flag and our anthem uh, is part of what binds us together as a nation. Now, this was great. He was asked about the Colin Kaepernick kneel and the NFL players kneeling, and we'll have more um, from him on those. But he just admitted right there that this is a divisive tactic. He just admitted that it's the national anthem that brings Americans together and it's something that is an honorary tradition here, especially before sporting events or any event that brings us together. For that moment, we all stand in uh, united as part of this union. So he admits that Colin Kaepernick's taking a knee or any athlete. We've also seen Megan Rapinoe from the United States soccer team take a knee. So there's President Obama admitting that that is a divisive tactic. Let's roll to the next one. Part of what makes this country special is that we respect people's rights to have a different opinion. That's funny that that would come out of the lips of Barack Obama when it's his liberal media, it's his liberal sheep following that wants to silence all conservative outlets, that wants to shut us up. We even have reports coming up later tonight of Donald Trump supporters getting beat up at rallies because they're wearing a Trump hat. So this is completely hypocritical of anyone of the left to say, and it gets even more hypocritical. Let's roll the next one. We fight sometimes so that people can do things that we disagree with. And I want everybody to listen to each other. Really, Barack Obama, you want everyone to listen to each other? You're fighting for my right to free speech, to speak out against you, to speak out against Hillary Clinton? And then he says he wants everybody to listen to each other. Let's roll to the next one. Unfortunately, you've grown up hearing voices that incessantly warn of government as nothing more than some separate sinister entity that's at the root of all our problems. Some of these same voices also do their best to gum up the works. They'll warn that tyranny is always lurking just around the corner. 
He should reject these voices. Well, reject these voices? Wait a second, Barack. You just said you want everyone to communicate. You just said you want everyone to hear one another. Oh, but that was him just a few years ago at a commencement speech telling you to ignore voices that are the conservatives, that are Infowars.com, that are Michael Savage, warning you about government tyranny, warning you about government corruption, which includes him. He wants to silence those voices. He wants you to ignore those voices. But here he is last night saying he wants everyone to listen to everyone. This is a perfect example of the left. They want you to listen to everyone when everyone shares the same viewpoint as them. But if somebody has a different viewpoint, they want to silence you and they want those voices to be ignored. Ah, I love when Barack Obama gives us the perfect opportunity to show how he is a complete hypocrite. Let's roll the next one. What I have been careful about when I describe these issues is to make sure that we do not lump these murderers into the billion Muslims that exist around the world, including in this country. Yeah, he wants to be careful about that, folks. He wants to be careful about not lumping people into one group. Even though Hillary Clinton did that with Donald Trump supporters, I would even say that he's done that with Donald Trump supporters. He's done that with police officers. He's done that with white people. Again, more total hypocrisy out of this man's mouth. Now, the amazing thing is the question was addressed to him why won't he say the words radical Islamic terror? He went on an answer that probably lasted three to four minutes. Hey, guess what? He never said radical Islamic terror in his answer. Shocker. Let's roll to the next one. Well, I'm not, as a Christian, I'm not going to let them claim my religion and say you're killing for Christ. I would, I would say that's ridiculous. That's not what my religion stands for. Call these folks what they are, which is killers and terrorists. Now, here's the thing about that. They're also Muslims, okay? So I understand what Barack Obama is saying. If I'm a Christian and there's people going around chopping people's heads off, stabbing people, shooting up nightclubs, blowing bombs up, homemade bombs all over these cities, and they claim to be doing this in the name of Jesus, and I'm a Christian, I would say, that's not my religion. Don't let me in with those people. However, I wouldn't be offended if you said radical Christians. But here's the difference, Barack Obama. That's not happening. We have case after case after case of people saying Allah Akbar and then going out and committing atrocities, going out and committing terrorist attacks. So, again, he refuses to say radical Islamic terror. He stands up for the religion of Islam, which that's perfectly fine. You have the right to whatever religion you want in this country. But let's not be fooled. These are radical Islamic terrorists who are terrorizing this country now. Let's roll to the next one. The danger is where... We get loose in this language, particularly when a president uh, or people aspiring to get pres become president um, get loose with this language. You can you can see in some of the language that we've in talking about Muslim Americans here, and the notion that somehow we'd start having religious tests in, in who can come in the country. And just to interject, yeah. you were clearly talking about the Republican nominee Donald Trump just then. You think? No, that I wasn't. Does anyone buy that? Is anyone buying that? He clearly goes right after Donald Trump, Donald Trump and his policies. Jake Tapper, shockingly, with that hideous tie, calls him out on it, and then he denies it. <laughs> I tell you, the boldness of this guy is simply stunning. He, he literally goes, like, quote for quote, trying to attack Donald Trump on his immigration policies. Jake Tapper's hideous tie calls him out. He says, I wasn't talking about Donald Trump. Oh, of course not. No, I don't want to get into this. What an absolute bold-faced liar. Let's roll to the next one. This is going to be a challenge that we have for a while. It is possible for individuals or uh, small groups of people to be inspired, uh, even though they're not directed. By Islam. From the outside, even though there's not a complicated plot. Inspired by Islam. And these so-called lone wolf terrorist actors are going to be our biggest danger. So he just basically told you that you just need to be prepared and you need to accept lone wolf terrorism coming to America and there's just nothing they can do about it. It's just organic. It's homegrown now and there's nothing you can do. He even says that these events are being inspired, but he won't say radical Islamic terrorism. Again, I don't see the Bible uh, inspiring people to go kill people. I don't see, um, you know, priests and cardinals 
and bishops inspiring people to go commit acts of terror. But we're seeing this in the religion of Islam. This is just a fact, Barack Obama. I don't know what rock you're living under, but it must be pretty cozy under there. Let's roll to the next one. If you look worldwide, uh, the number of terrorist incidents have not substantially increased. Well, how about if we just look in America? How about if we just decided to look in America? I know that this is not something Obama likes to do, but you know, here at InfoWars, we like to look at America. We're Americans. And in America, under your administration, terrorist attacks are now becoming the norm. In fact, it's so bad now, folks, you can't even keep up with all of these terrorist attacks. They happen so much. I mean, it is really sad. So Obama wants to sit here and act like the world is a more peaceful place. But look within, look domestically, folks. It is without a doubt Terrorism is striking this country at a much greater ratio than it was before Barack Obama was president, at least in the number of events. Let's roll to the next one. Uh, ability to purchase firearms can go into a store legally, buy a bunch of firearms, and if he goes into a club and decides he wants to shoot a lot of folks, he can do a lot of damage. So now Barack Obama is, to me, he's basically making a battle cry for all of these terrorists who want to come here and do just that. And then he wants to blame guns. And of course, the ultimate irony is, and this is why he says that they can get away with it. If there were good citizens there with a gun, they would stop the radical terrorist with a gun immediately. And how many people died would be minimalized. But he doesn't want that. He only wants to have guns himself. Let's roll to the last one. What this legislation did was it said... If uh, a private citizen believes that uh, having been victimized by terrorism, that another country didn't do enough to stop one of its citizens, for example, in engaging in terrorism, then they can file a personal lawsuit, a private lawsuit in court. And the problem with that is that if we eliminate this notion of sovereign immunity, then our men and women in uniform around the world could potentially start seeing ourselves subject to reciprocal laws. Did Barack Obama just admit that the United States allows terrorists to operate in this country? That's what it sounds like. We will start by reducing premiums by as much as $2,500 per family. A system where we're gonna work with your employers to lower your premiums by up to $2,500 per family per year. Here's what change is saying to people who already have health insurance and the employers who are providing it will work to lower your premiums by up to $2,500 per family per year. I also have a health care plan that would save the average family $2,500 on their premiums. And if you already have health care, then we're gonna reduce costs uh, an average of $2,500 per family on premiums. It's time to bring down the typical family premium by $2,500. It's time to bring down the costs for the entire country. And we'll cut the cost of a typical family's health care by up to $2,500 per year. Well, Internet pioneer Matt Drudge created a firestorm over the weekend, tweeting, just paid the Obamacare penalty for not getting covered. I'm calling it a liberty tax. But a White House representative firing back, tweeting, Flat lie, no fee for previous years. Scary how much influence he once had. The Obama administration and the liberal media have told us again and again and again that there is no individual mandate that requires us to buy health insurance. If you don't want it, you don't have to buy it, right? But when tax season comes around, you better be ready to pay the price big time. And that's because if you don't have health insurance, there is a stiff penalty. Americans who don't buy health care coverage will face a heftier fine in 2016. There are 10.5 million uninsured Americans eligible for coverage under the Affordable Care Act. But the Obama administration expects only a quarter will sign up this year, even though those that don't could pay a higher penalty in their taxes. But that's almost a 50 percent jump from the $661 fine for this year, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation. It's even worse for those who don't qualify for financial aid to buy Obamacare. 
their plans. They'll pay an average of $1,400. And $50 in 2016. Now, new data from the IRS reveals that in 2014, over 8 million Americans paid a staggering $1.7 billion in Obamacare penalties. And we know that that number is expected to be even higher, much higher in 2015, 2016, and beyond. So let me get this straight. Obamacare was passed because people couldn't afford health insurance. But now, because of Obamacare, people are being heavily fined because they can't afford health insurance. Premiums are up and some people have decided they're not so affordable. Premiums have also increased. The cost of a mid-level plan is up an average of 7.5%. It's due in part because a number of companies have left the marketplace. Fewer insurers means less competition. No, I actually didn't know the, <laughs> the penalty was that high. And if you own a business, chances are you too are getting effed over by Obamacare. First, the employer mandate, as you mentioned, kicks in for companies with 100 or more people and some of them are going to decide this may not be worth the cost. But even those with the 50 to 99 people are going to have to make a very detailed monthly statements in terms of uh, getting ready for this thing. And the companies with under 50 people are going to have some surprises. For example, if you own two small businesses, the federal government combines those. So you may be picked up by this even if you uh, don't realize it yet. However, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And his name is Donald Trump. Trump. And his plan for health care reform is easily accessible on his website, DonaldTrump.com. It's all laid out in plain English for everyone to see. Economic and financial experts agree that it is, well, it's a rock solid plan to repeal the incredible economic burden of Obamacare once and for all. What's your plan for Obamacare? Obamacare is going to be repealed and replaced. I'm Darren McBrain, and you can watch more reports right now at Infowars.com. Major news happening on the health front this month. One particular story stands out. Bayer bought Monsanto for $66 billion this month. Now, this is the largest corporate cash buyout in history, and it is a huge step in the direction of controlling the world's food supply. So now you're thinking you're merging GMOs, pesticides, and pharmaceutical drugs, as well as crop seeds. This has huge implications because now we're seeing these huge corporate giants consolidate, which means monopoly. Now we'll get back to that in a minute because the reason why this is so key is because we are depending on these people to give us the research that we need to know if genetically modified foods, for instance, are a safe bet. What are the long-term repercussions on our health? Well, there's a story coming out in The Guardian. Pesticide manufacturers' own tests reveal that there has been serious harm to honeybees from their own products, but they're not releasing this information to the public. So this is unpublished field trials. The research was conducted by Syngenta and Bayer on their neonicotinoid insecticides, and they were obtained recently by Greenpeace after a freedom of information request. Now, this is key because neonicotinoids are the world's most widely used insecticide, and there is clear scientific evidence that they do cause harm to honeybees at the levels found in fields, but there hasn't really been any evidence that they can cause harm to the entire colony. Uh, this new research reveals that Syngenta and Bayer's, some of their neonicotinoids can actually seriously harm the colony at high doses. They didn't find any significant effects below concentrations of 50 parts per billion or 40 parts per billion, respectively. So this is why they're saying, you know, it's we didn't really need to release this information out to the public because usually in fields, the concentrations are below 10 parts per billion. But a lot of people are pushing back against that, saying this. There is so much debate surrounding these insecticides and these neonicotinoids. All of this research should be made public especially when you consider that their tests are highly regulatory. They're very contained. They're in a contained environment. They're only exposing them to these uh, neonicotinoids for a short amount of time. This isn't what bees would be experiencing in the real world, in the real environment. They are, of course, going to be exposed to neonics in planting dust, water that the bees drink or the wildflowers drink. Wherever neonics are used as seed treatments, they're going to be 
ingesting a cocktail of pesticides, not just the one pesticide for a short amount of time in this controlled environment. So this is the type of information that scientists are saying, you need to be putting that out there so people can understand what we're dealing with. As well, you have a lot of independent researchers that are spending a lot of money on their own trying to do these type of field tests, and it would save them a lot of cost if this type of information that the public should have access to should be made public. So if we can't even see that they're gonna be forthcoming about the results of their tests that show that they do indeed cause harm to honeybee colonies, how can we expect them to be forthcoming about the results of, say, uh, long-term health effects of genetically modified food? Because let's not forget, this is Bayer, who decades ago knowingly sold AIDS-infected medication to hemophiliacs. Internal documents show that after this company positively, absolutely knew that they had a medication that was infected with the AIDS virus, they took the product off the market in the U.S. and then they dumped it in France, Europe, Asia, and Latin America. The medicine's called Factor 8. It was an, inject an injection medicine that was used for hemophiliacs, mostly children. Children had been born with an injury. Hold on, hold on, Mike. So hold on, hold on. So you're yeah. telling me that Bear knew that this drug was infected with the AIDS virus. They yanked it from the market in America, and then they dumped it in markets overseas? They had to figure out a way, Joe, to make a profit on a product that they could not sell in America. So I'm sure when it comes to the future of the Bayer-Monsanto merger, or even with these tests coming out on the neonicotinoids and the long-term effects on honeybee colonies, I'm sure they're going to have the best interests of the public in mind when they're moving forward with their research, right? So these type of studies are the very studies that companies themselves say are so important, so vital to get out there, and yet they're not telling people what they find. They're only releasing these results if someone insists via a FOIA request. And for months, they've been downplaying the results. In fact, Syngenta actually told Greenpeace in August that none of the studies that Syngenta had commissioned or undertaken showed any damage to the health of bee colonies. But now, thanks to this FOIA request, we can see the studies actually contradict that statement. So they're telling the public one thing when their studies are revealing something completely different. And these are the people that we are now supposed to trust with a large portion of the world's seeds. And it's not just Bayer and Monsanto, but it's also Dow and DuPont, Syngenta and ChemChina. So these are corporations that are merging. And so consolidation equals monopoly. And where we're really going to start to see the effects of all of this power is if the Trans-Pacific Partnership passes. Now, the reason why this will affect uh, a lot of the world, a lot of the globe, is because some countries are actually rejecting bringing in Monsanto's genetically modified seeds into their country. They're rejecting bringing in these harmful insecticides. Well, now, with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, corporate tribunals will actually take over the adjudication of disputes uh, in which the, a nation would reject importing toxic pesticides, GMOs, medical drugs. These tribunals will decide whether that nation is permitted to refuse importation. So, of course, these corporate tribunals are going to favor mega corporate interests. So this is the corporate face of globalism. This is going to give these companies the ability to shove these toxic products down our throats, even if we are rejecting them outright. They are going to give themselves the power to completely override our country's sovereignty. And we've got to start to push back. Don't vote for anyone who plans on passing the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is dire. This is huge. This is a giant step in the direction of controlling the world's food supply. I'm Leanne McAdoo reporting for Infowars.com. There's a troubling trend that's happening all across our country. People in Trump hats, Trump shirts, they're having the crap kicked out of them. Sometimes it's live stream. We have this one specific case coming out of Al Cajon, California. A man could be seen walking outside of a restaurant. He had on a red Trump hat, Make America Great Again. He was attacked by a mob. They basically threw him to the ground, beaten him, kicked him, beat him up. They live streamed it on Periscope. We actually have a video clip of this. Take a look. Hey, 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 hey. 
This is what happens. 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 Hey, you got that? I, I've just been assaulted several times. I was assaulted several times. Several times I was assaulted for wearing my hat. Just for just for how I'm being cussed at, assaulted. I'm being I'm being assaulted just for that. arrive and the one question they have for him is why did you wear that hat so supporting a presidential candidate in this country could get the crap kicked out of you if the wrong people see it that was the that was the question that the police officers had for him you know and he, he basically said I'm simply a supporter of Donald J Trump who happens to want equality and I didn't want to provoke an attack that wasn't my intention it was a simple hat that he was wearing uh, this echoes a case that we've covered here on Infowars on our website there's an article up right now female student attack for wearing Trump hat on campus this young woman she was just simply wearing a hat after Monday night's debate to show her support for the candidate she was assaulted by a man uh, coming out wearing this hat and according to a press release put out by the Minnesota College Republicans the victim of the assault had chosen she wants to remain anonymous because again just like this young man she wasn't trying to provoke an attack at all she was simply just wearing a hat and and uh, she resorted to asking campus security uh, to escort her around college because she no longer feels safe, um, even at her own school, because she's subject to physical assault. If people see the Trump support, they attack. We've seen the rise with Black Lives Matter, this movement that normalizes violence, normalizes the burning down of homes, businesses, cars, beating people in the streets simply for being Caucasian. It's normalized this in our society. But we're seeing that anger and aggression turn towards people who are openly supporting Trump in the streets. There's almost like a quiet fear that you're not supposed to say that you're a Trump supporter if in fact you are you know people are sometimes shocked to hear that other people that are that are in their social circle are Trump supporters it's almost like they're in the closet but these two specific cases highlight what's happening around the country unapologetically getting the crap kicked out of them and assaulted simply for supporting Donald J Trump Well, we wanted to bring your attention to a huge story that's gone virtually unnoticed by the media. Of course, we've got this reality show playing out mm -hmm. in real time here in the U.S. with this current election cycle. But we are also quite aware of the fact that World War III is a brewing. <laughs> so it really doesn't matter who gets elected. Whoever it is is going to have to be overseeing World War III. Mm -hmm. Now, these are statements that were made uh, by U.S. State Department spokesman John Kirby, basically threatening Moscow with terror attacks in Russian cities and even shooting down Russian jets if Putin continues to fight ISIS there in Syria. So take a listen to what Kirby had to say, Margaret. I mean, this is just crazy. Someone who has been in Russia understands how threatening and volatile like why are you poking this bear so he says extremist groups will continue to exploit the vacuums that are there in Syria to expand their operations which could include attacks against Russian interests perhaps even Russian cities Russia will continue to send troops home in body bags and will continue to lose resources perhaps even aircraft more Russian lives will be lost more Russian aircraft will be shot down now of course <laughs> is this not true of U.S. troops as well? Uh, what is he saying? Of course, a Russian foreign ministry spokesperson is taking these remarks as a thinly veiled threat. Mm -hmm. There's no veil, Leanne. They're, they're absolutely threatening Russia, saying that we will come after you if you don't stop killing ISIS. That's the bottom line. And this State Department official, their spokesperson, John Kirby, he's not even masking the fact that he's threatening their military craft, their citizens, their cities. This is major, major news. This is not hyped up. There's no drama involved in this. We are literally on the precipice of World War III. And as somebody who who understands the dynamic somewhat just from living and working in Moscow, they they see us, everything that we do is a provocation. I really didn't understand it. So you get outside from behind the propaganda of the U.S. and you do realize, oh my gosh, we do have missiles pointed on the Russian border. We are threatening their military aircraft. And hey, also, Donald Trump made this incredible comment a few weeks ago, it went largely unnoticed. He said, why the hell do we care if they're bombing ISIS? Right. Why do we care if they're killing the terrorist? Isn't that in everybody's 
these interests. You know, why don't we just let them? And the, the, the fact of the matter is, our own State Department um, has armed these rebels that are now ISIS. They've given them the northern part of Iraq, which is in vast control of the oil in Iraq, which they're selling to China, by the way, and funding more terrorism. And we, in a preliminary stage, funded them. I don't know if you recall John McCain going to Syria, yes. standing with the rebels. Well, guess what? They're now destroying and targeting U.S. citizens. So, right. And this is exactly what uh, the foreign ministry spokesperson there in Russia is saying, mm -hmm. that it sounds more, what John Kirby is saying, sounds more like a get -em command rather than a diplomatic comment, not mm -hmm. trying to be polite, but, you know, hey, we're kind of in charge of these moderate rebels, and boy, it would be a shame if mm -hmm. they shot down some more of your, your jets and mm -hmm. took out some more of your troops and perhaps even attacked your cities outright. Can you imagine if Putin had made some sort of a threat mm -hmm. saying that, well, you know, ISIS could just come in and maybe take out some cities there in the U.S.? Would that not be a red line oh. that Obama would have to maybe go to war? Correct. That is such a, so just putting ourselves in their shoes for a moment. If if one superpower said to the U.S., we're going to send your guys home in body bags. We're going to destroy your aircraft because you're killing terrorists. Well, first of all, let's not forget that Syria is a sovereign nation. Russia is a sovereign state, also happens to be a world superpower. And the fact that we're using these provoking words and Russia even frames it, you know, going back to how they see these statements, they're basically saying that this U.S. State Department spokesperson, John, Kirby and what he said this week, it is it's it's basically seen as a provocation mm -hmm. prior to war. So right. we we see this blustering. We saw it in World War II, uh, where world leaders were threatening and, and doing these sort of uh, provoking remarks months prior to the you know the beginning of World War II. We're seeing this again. We're right on the cusp. And uh, let's not forget. And I, I don't mean to get off topic here, but Wesley Clark, very famous general, once ran for president seven years ago. He said, "Look, the U.S. has a list of countries that we're planning on taking out." We're taking out. Iraq was on, on this list. So was Syria. So was Libya. It's in, it ends with Iran, by the way. But Syria was on our list. We have an agenda. Russia's stopping our agenda. So now, oh, by the way, we also have to go after Russia. That's right. what's happening. Hey, you know, and let's not forget, this is, of course, just coming about two weeks after the U.S. reportedly became ISIS's air force mm -hmm. by mistakenly taking out the base mm -hmm. there. And it's like, I'm sorry, but our military is not that stupid. This was a well set up base, so it's not as if they mistakenly took out the wrong base and helped ISIS. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is a major provocation mm -hmm. and also threatening World War III is absolutely insane. If you think about it, Trump's going to get in. He's making all of these promises mm -hmm. to the American people, but there's no way he's going to be able to uphold those promises. If he gets elected, he's going to immediately have to start dealing with World War III mm -hmm. that's being propped up, which is why Hillary Clinton can't wait to get in there because mm -hmm. she's all ready to ride that little horse mm -hmm. right into Armageddon. So let's kind of shift gears here and talk a little bit about Hillary Clinton <laughs> and her plans to do whatever it takes to get elected um, you know, these are very bad people, mm -hmm. and they've been bad people for decades. A lot of people were very upset with the debate. For instance, this first debate, they said that the debate moderator ignored all of Hillary's scandals. Trump was saying, uh, look, he hit me on the birther thing. He hit me on a housing deal from many years ago that I settled with no recourse. That's a beauty to be asked about a 40-year-old lawsuit that he settled with no mm -hmm. recourse. Can you imagine the skeletons in Hillary Clinton's closet oh that my. he could have pulled out, but he didn't? And that's not it. So this was just kind of the tip of the iceberg. But let's go ahead and look at some of the conspiracy theories that are going around online. First off, we've got this article up on InfoWars. What's that under Hillary's pantsuit during <laughs> the debate? <laughs> Did you see those pictures? Oh, my. So she clearly has this box with a cord in her back. And uh, we noticed on the first commander-in-chief forum that she was wearing an earpiece very noticeably. And you would think that that would be a violation of the rules. Uh, but this time that wasn't noticeable. But what was noticeable was this cord in this case. And I think it's, I personally think it is something uh, that has to do with the electrodes going into her back so she doesn't have seizures. Mm -hmm. It's possible I think it's, it's medical. Some, I think it's some type of a medical device. But... Either way, whatever it is, people can now clearly see it under these big boxy clothing that mm -hmm. she's constantly wearing to hide these devices. And people deserve to know what the heck is going on with her mm -hmm. health. Mm -hmm. But that's not even it. It doesn't even stop there. That's not even the weirdness. Now, there was a, someone tweeted a video. Um, if we can go ahead and put that video up, it's about this, this guy. Who's the guy with the, with the briefcase? Or he takes uh, Hillary Clinton's notes. So you just watch this. It'll play out. They're walking out. This was after that five-minute delay. And, you know, they go shake the moderate. Who's that guy up at Hillary Clinton's podium taking the little files out? 
they go shake hands and and he goes and stands over in the corner and oh got to wait for for Lester to you know get his attention and then he walks over and there's the little handoff well, who is that guy? Oh, man. I don't know. Well, I mean, maybe that's normal, but yeah. it's something uh, that nobody noticed. They cut away. They have such a history of corruption that, honestly, I don't, I, I honestly believe this. That lady's reality is so skewed. She doesn't understand when she's lying and telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the skeletons in her closet. We were going to break down this earlier. Uh, James Comey, the director of the FBI, uh, there was an article that came out that said the FBI, the agents handling it, had to sign these confidentiality agreements prior to even working on the Clinton investigation. So they had to protect themselves. And if they talked to the press or talked to the public in any way about Clinton, they would lose their careers, lose their pensions. And it looks like Comey has been one of the largest advocates in protecting the Clinton Foundation and her corruption scandals because the FBI agents, they were blocked from even serving search warrants. Uh, uh, in retrieving key evidence in some cases. There's this laundry list of things that they're not allowed to do. Um, the FBI agents were even blocked and suppressed uh, by DOJ brass, this article asserts. And, um, you know, they were basically used. And Cheryl Mills, mind you, and other people that were affiliated with Clinton that did her dirty work, uh, two uh, people connected to her server, they were both given criminal immunity from the right. FBI. That was the only way they would let them to get into. Uh, their emails to their own private servers is that they would have to have immunity. And of course, how weird is that that Cheryl Mills was able to represent Hillary Clinton during this investigation, Ooh. even though she was involved in it. So all <laughs> super creepy. And then, of course, let's not forget that there's also people saying that Hillary Clinton gave hand signals to the debate moderator, Lester Holt. Uh, we've got the video continues to be taken down. It keeps getting slapped um, with a copyright. But uh, Mike Cernovich actually tweeted out to one of his friends, who's like this world famous uh, world champion poker player, who said, indeed, signaling to the face like that is one of the oldest um, hand signals in the book to communicate. If they had been inside of a, con a casino and she was doing that, they would have gotten taken off the table. Mm -hmm. And so what they're saying in this video is that every time she wanted to slap a zinger on Donald Trump, she would do this thing with her face, very noticeable. Mm -hmm. And Lester Holt would either interject with Trump, he would interrupt Trump, or he would stay on that topic and throw to Hillary Clinton. So these people will do whatever it takes. They will stop at nothing mm -hmm. to get this woman in. Why? I think it's because, you know, she wants to ride that train into World War III. <laughs>
uh, we can see for, for years, American Bridge 21st Century, it's a super PAC that shares office space with Media Matters for America. Uh, they pay rent to, to Media Matters for America. Now, Media Matters for America is a nonprofit 501c3. They have to submit um, uh, what's called a Form 990. It's a, the nonprofit version of a tax return. And there's two options uh, to report rental income, as I described in the report. But Media Matters doesn't report uh, any rental income. Uh, I focused on three years on the report, 2012 through 2014. We can clearly see um, almost $300,000 of, of uh, rent payments to Media Matters, uh, but they don't report it in their tax returns. Um, it's a cut and dry argument. A, a cut and dry argument. Um, and honestly, the most shocking thing about all this is that this data has been sitting out there for four years, and I'm the only, I'm, I'm the first person to to report on this. But what a crazy situation it is to be a guy that's interested in learning more about the system to find something this damning. And if I don't come forward and say something, then it's just not going to be uncovered. Nobody's going to uh, know what's happening here. So I'm having to step up and and uh, speak out. So Andrew, you did all of this work by yourself as a citizen. It's like you're doing the IRS's job for them. Could you even believe when you found this evidence? No, uh, it was it was shocking to find it. And then it was even more shocking to find that nobody else was reporting on it. I mean, what's going on if there's all this dirt that's just sitting out on the surface? Uh, and, uh, you know, we're, we're also focused on the on the email leaks, um, on those sensational stories. But man, there's stuff that's just sitting out there on the surface that nobody's looking at. Um, everything on the site, there's eight articles that all encompass one larger story. And it's all just using public facing information. Um, all I've done is, uh, is uncover it and, and highlight the key points. Now let's talk about the flow chart. This exemplifies how he's laundering the money and using the Bonner Group as kind of the middleman that, that takes all of these profits and filters them back into the overall larger conglomerate of the super PACs. I mean, this is the Jordan Belfort of the Democratic Party campaign contributions. Yeah, so there's a, so I identified 14 separate organizations, separate entities that, um, that share office space with, with Media Matters. And one of them is the Bonner Group. And, um, you know, before going any further, uh, the IRS requires organizations to disclose who they give money grants to, but they don't require them to disclose who they receive that money from. So it's a really weak system of one-way verification that looks like it's uh, that's how they're abusing this uh, system. Um, and so when we follow the money, for instance, when we just start at Media Matters, if you go to their 2014 tax return, you can see that they give money uh, to the Franklin Education Forum and to the American Independent. Uh, both are organizations that share office space with Media Matters. Now, when we look at the Franklin Education Forum, um, they received, I believe it was $930,000 from Media Matters. Uh, their total revenue for 2014 was about $980,000. So well over 90% of their funds came from Media Matters. But they credit the Bonner Group for raising 100% of those funds. They paid the Bonner Group $120,000 commission in 2014. Um, and furthermore, they actually state uh, towards the end of the tax return that they don't share expenses with uh, any of the other organizations. So the Franklin Education Forum did pay $120,000 to the Bonner Group, uh, and that was essentially David Brock writing a check to himself. Exactly. It's like, all these organizations. exactly. It's like if I cut a check to myself and then claimed you were the middleman, and then we had a collusion going on where we both made massive amounts of money, but because there's two different names for these super PACs, we're able to get away with it. Now, let's talk about m farther than just David Brock, but what implications does this have with the Democratic Party and specifically Hillary Clinton? Well, I also uncovered records that uh, that the Clinton campaign is uh, is colluding with um, with this conglomerate. Um, correct the record as you described yesterday. It's essentially, just an army of paid internet trolls to correct Hillary Clinton's record. Um, and they, due to some loopholes in the in our system, they actually legally coordinate with the Clinton campaign. So that's fine in a way. I mean, they're they're following the rules. 
the thing with those that there are no rules that enable uh, the Clinton campaign to coordinate with American Bridge 21st Century, which is one of the super PACs that shares office space in the in the conglomerate. American Bridge 21st Century is an organization that's devoted to opposition research. So they actually have about 50 what they call trackers that just follow around uh, Republican politicians and try to catch them, uh, you know, in the in these gaffes. Um, and they accept unlimited funds from uh, from outside uh, resources to, you know, to to fund these activities. And I actually uncovered a, a receipt uh, that the Clinton campaign purchased research from American Bridge 21st Century in December 2015. So imagine my surprise when I look up this transaction and nothing comes up. Uh, nobody has reported this. And, and this is something that it, it'll take you five minutes. You go to the FEC's website, search American Bridge 21st Century, and you can see this exact transaction for yourself. And, um, and I'm the first person to, to bring this up. Furthermore, I found evidence that uh, from the, their FEC filings that the uh, assistant treasurer for American Bridge 21st Century is also the assistant treasurer for Correct the Record. Um, David Brock has come out and said that he's able to operate these organizations in his office uh, and work with the Clinton campaign with Correct the Record because he has cut off operational discussions with American Bridge 21st Century. But here we have the assistant treasurer of both of these organizations is the same exact person. I mean, it's obvious that the campaign strategy is, is, uh, is reaching these, these other organizations. They openly collaborate with Correct the Record, and then we see a clear uh, trail to, um, to the other organizations such as the American Bridge 21st Century. I mean, it's a, it's a shadow campaign and it's uh, not legal at all. And it's, just, it's been happening and, and nobody has said anything about it. Andrew Kerr from thecitizensaudit.com. Amazing reports he's put out. He's been working on this for a long time. He says his goal is to get media matters audited by the IRS. He's already done the IRS's job for them. All they got to do is come in and bring this guy down. Thank you so much for your time, Andrew. Thanks, Owen. Wow, what a scathing report. We've caught David Brock red-handed. We've caught Media Matters red-handed. When will the IRS step in and do their job? Thanks to everybody who tuned into the nightly news tonight, PrisonPlanet.com. Leanne McAdoo has the news tomorrow night, 7 o'clock central, Infowars.com.